Compañeros, welcome to the SQL Data Partners podcast, the podcast dedicated to SQL Server-related topics, which is designed to help you become familiar with what's out there, how you might use those features or ideas on how you might apply them in your environments. I am Carlos El Chacon. And I am Steve Stedman. We are two data professionals trying to help others get a better handle on their database environments, either through this podcast, our training, or our consulting practice. Thanks for joining us on the SQL Trail. Welcome to the show. SQL Data Partners. Compañeros, welcome to episode 120. It is good to have you on the SQL Trail again today. Hey, Carlos, it's good to be here. How are you doing today? Other episodes. Oh, it is cold season here in the United States, and uh, that bug is, has come my way. So well, you'll forgive me if I sound a little a little different from other episodes. <laughs> I guess that's part of the benefit of our virtual studio is I don't have to be sitting next to you when you get cold. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, of all the bugs that, uh, that travel in cyberspace, that's the one we don't have to worry about, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> Speaking of problems in cyberspace, our topic today is SQL injection. Yes. This is a topic that I've actually tried to bring on uh, before, but I felt like I needed the right speaker or the right guest. And I feel like we, we, we got him. Uh, yep. Bert Wagner from Cleveland is going to be our guest today, and we're excited to have him on the show. Yeah. You know, I didn't really all we were going to dive into when we first did this recording. And I think that Bert did a great job, and I really, really enjoyed the the recording. I mean, not that we don't enjoy every recording with every guest, but there was some interesting things we covered in this one. Right, that's right, and and I think um, and I think um, it's interesting, and I guess I'll go ahead and, and jump in and actually do a compañero shout out because I think there's a little tie in here, and Eric Corsten, right? So he commented on episode 118 and thought we did a good job explaining the mechanics of index maintenance for the non DBAs, and I think Bert does a pretty good job here, kind of going through because SQL injections, I mean, one of those topics that it's specific in what it is, but trying to identify it is not simple, right? Right, and and I thought uh, Bert did a great job of, of bringing some of that stuff together and and illustrating it. Not not that it's you know this episode is meant to be holistic, right? Like every single possibility by any stretch of the imagination. But I think getting a good foundation and and getting started, I think we've done a good job there. Yep, and I hope that based off of what we've done on this podcast, that people will go and uh, do a little bit with that and uh, figure out if they have issues that could be resolved yeah. around SQL injection. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's one of the things we always try to do with our episodes. Mentions. Projection. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's one of the things we always try to do with our episodes is to make sure we kind of have a baseline and so that people can approach the topic, whether they don't you know, know too much about it, and at least uh, you know get conversational about it. And, yep. and so uh, we're, we're glad to have Bert on. And then, of course, Eric, thanks for your comment there. Yep. So are there other Compañero shout outs this week besides Eric? We do. We have just a couple of other mentions that we had with interactions in social media. So Mala, if ever if you know Mala and from Kentucky, shout out to her. Jess Pomfret. There was a, a some dialogue on on social media about uh, technical podcasts, and ours came up. And uh, Jess was like, "Oh yeah, I already, I already have. I already listened to those. <laughs> I already <laughs> listened to Single Data Partners podcast." I'm like, "Okay, yeah. there we go. Thanks, Jess." And then there was something from Mr. Ha as well, right? Yeah, Mr. Ha out on Twitter, listening to our episodes. We appreciate that. And in a session, we kind of have a guest. Obviously, he's been a guest on our show, and uh, we enjoyed talking with Randolph. Uh, he referenced our SQL Trail, the, the conference we, we held last last month, giving a shout out to those who, who did a BIML session. We kind of have a, a, a an impromptu session on, on BIML, and, and he referenced it about a month later, which I thought was interesting. And so... Uh, kind of coming together, he probably was working on something that and, and thought he could reference some material there. So thanks to uh, to Randolph for, for mentioning that. Yep. And then after the first of the year, uh, we're going to do a tips and tricks episode on maybe some things that aren't entirely obvious when you're working with SQL Server or Management Studio. And I guess one of the things we're asking for is uh, send us your submissions. If there's something that you think is super cool that is not entirely obvious to other people, and how you do things in Management Studio or SQL Server or any of our, our SQL tools, just uh, send it our way. And uh, we'll try and include that in the episode. Some of those episodes, but so compañeros, 
right? The, that invitation is still there. I was thinking about this and I don't know if it is, and maybe through the website, you know, I don't know if there's some screenshots that need to be shared or whatnot. So if you want to create a Word doc and send it my way, right? Carlos.chacon at SQLDataPartners.com. You know, send me that Word doc and we, and we can do that. Um, or if you need to reference a blog post, something like that, we can do that as well. So, or, uh, or if you really want to have your, your voice on the podcast, you can go to SQLDataPartners.com and there's a place you can leave us uh, a recording. And you can right. describe what it is that uh, your tip or trick is there. And, that's right. Uh, on the podcast page. That's right. right. On the podcast page. And we can include that in the podcast as well. Hey, that's right. So we're looking forward uh, to some of those starting in January. Uh, something else you want to talk about is the Database Health Monitor webcast. Yes. So on December 14th at 1 p.m. Eastern, to meeting, we're going to use GoToMeeting to do a webcast of uh, Database Health Monitor, and this is gonna be a brief training on how to use the Quick Scan Report. If you haven't used Database Health Monitor and you don't know what the Quick Scan Report is, it's really, it's a report that goes in and checks a whole bunch of stuff and comes back with sort of a, an assessment that says these are the things that you might wanna take a look at on your server. And it's kind of a, I called it the Quick Scan Report because it was just a quicker way than jumping around through dozens of different reports, and it kind of just consolidates it all into one place. Right. And, uh, We'll do a training on that and some of the things that you find in there and what, what those findings mean and how to deal with them. Yeah, that's right. And that'll be on December 14th, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And if you're in another time zone, you'll have to extrapolate from those numbers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so sqldatapartners.com slash webcast. We'll get you those details and uh, you can register for the webcast. And again, ultimately, this is uh, helping us, you know, obviously put together some documentation, but then we thought we'd invite you all. There, so. We hope that you'll tune in. And that's really, if you haven't used Database Health Monitor or you're brand new to it, great. Come and listen and you'll learn a bit there. If you've been using it for a while and maybe you haven't used the Quick Scan Report regularly, well, it's uh, going to be good for you as well. So yep. please join us. Yes. And so with that, a little SQL Server in the news. Ooh. So, so lots of, you know, Microsoft's trying to get lots of hooks into your on-premise data and bring it into the cloud. <laughs> and they have another one, right? So we have, we've had all these uh, migration tools and then they, they you know, it had talked about the uh, managed instance, right? And so now they have the Azure Database Migration Service. Wow. And so this is kind of like, uh, hey, you have a database, you want to get up to Azure, and it doesn't matter where you want to go to, Maybe you want to go to Azure SQL Data. Now they have the Azure Database Migration Service. Wow. And so this is kind of like, uh, hey, you have a database. You want to get up to Azure. And it doesn't matter where you want to go to. Maybe you want to go to Azure SQL Database. Maybe you want to go to the managed instance. Or maybe you want to spin up a VM with Azure with a SQL Server on it. We'll help you take care of all of that. Use and the service. You, and you know, the interesting one I saw there is even it, it, they even list Oracle as one of those to migrate from. Yeah. So, yeah, very, very interesting there. I think, I mean, again, so it just came out in preview. What is interesting is that they are going to start charging for this service. So, apparently, I mean, I, I'm not sure once they work out the bugs, that, that it looks like they're looking at, looking at some reliability and performance issues. So, it's probably going to take a little while. It won't be free eventually. And then of course, then you'll get charged, you know, for all the usage after that. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. And VM is that so many things in Azure, you've got to just try it out, you've got to be paying money for it. And sometimes there's that can get quite expensive, right? But the fact that this is free in this trial mode right now, looks great. I mean, it looks like a great way to jump in and see, will what we want to migrate actually work? Right, exactly. Now, I guess I should say that, you know, so for example, even if you want to go to, to the VM, you know, so that VM would not be free just getting there, <laughs> the help getting there. So yep. there, there's a you know, slight distinction. So, yep. Okay. Well, I guess, uh, should we go ahead and get into the conversation with Bert? Yep. Let's do it. So the URL for this episode is sqldatapartners.com slash injection. Or sqldatapartners.com slash 120 for episode 120. Well, Bert, welcome to the program. Hey, hey guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show. I know we, uh, chatted at past summit at our SQL trail event. And I think that was a lot of fun. Good to meet you. 
Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Is that we get to uh, have a little bit of pleasure, right? And it's a trail mix and then do a little business as well and uh, and talk about our favorite subject, which is SQL Server. So we're, uh, we're glad to have you on. Our topic today is SQL injection. And I'm, I'm reminded of the meme out there and it's the stick figures, but you get you know a parent or something on the phone and, and then you, you see the you know, in caption captions. It's like, why did you name your table drop table students semicolon, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why did you name your son that? Yeah. <laughs> Those famous little Bobby tables, right? Really? Yeah, there you go. Little Bobby tables. That's right. <laughs> and so uh, that might set the stage a little bit for that idea of, of SQL injection. So I guess, why don't you, you know, we'll, we'll give, a, give you a minute. Tell, talk to us about SQL injection, kind of what it is and some of the problems. And then we, we'll kind of start from there. Sure. So, you know, SQL in, and SQL injection is essentially when you have a dynamic string, right, that you create in SQL that's getting executed and it ends up doing something that you didn't intend it to do, right? Uh, a user is passing in some parameter value that is then changing the content of that dynamic string that you built and is causing the query to perform an action um, that you weren't originally intending, right? So, I mean, in an essence, that's what a SQL injection attack is. And to give you an idea of, you know, from the minor things that can be done, obviously, um, it could be something not very malicious at all. It could... Um, you know, you could inject just random code that won't really do anything just to maybe test out if a server is vulnerable to SQL injection or not. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, right, you can go all the way to querying system tables to learn more about the data, learn more about the data, or querying and receiving the full contents of other tables. Um, you could modify and manipulate data. So it's not just, you know, read only. It's really any command that you can think of, you could potentially execute through a SQL injection vulnerability. Interesting. Now, with that, I mean, if somebody, I mean, it seems like there's kind of two categories there. There's one category that could do damage. And there's the other category that they're just browsing and they're borrowing, they're stealing, they're taking some of your data. And I think with that, is there necessarily any way to even know if someone has done that to your system? If, if there was a vulnerability there to know if anybody ever hit it? Right. I mean, so the the only way you'd be able to tell is through, you know, logging. If you are logging, you know, if you are having users input freeform data into a website or your application, right, which is then maybe kicking off a stored procedure or some hack or not, or your application, right, which is then maybe kicking off a stored procedure or some ad hoc query. If you're logging that information, you'd be able to tell. But if you're not doing that kind of logging, then you might not know. It's just, it really depends. And it's, it's not just the, the, you know, knowing whether you have an injection attack or not becomes a big issue because if you, if you don't know, then you don't really know the validity of the data that is on your server, right? A lot of times people think SQL injection, why does it matter? And, you know, the first big thing comes to mind is, oh, someone's going to steal all our database data. They're going to steal our usernames, our passwords, our highly sensitive data about our customers. And obviously that's a really big problem, but that's not the only problem that you get, right? Like what you're alluding to, data validity might be a problem if you don't know that someone is maybe manipulating data on your server. Maybe they're you know, you're running a shopping cart and they want to give themselves you with themselves a really good discount. So they're, you know, updating the prices of uh, <laughs> oh, there you go. In your products table. Right. And they're they're buying all those My airline ticket is a little too expensive. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I mean, so that's I mean, that's a major, major problem there. And if you don't know what's happening. Right. There's no guaranteed way of finding out. Um, and then just to round it off the, you know. Uh, another major issue with with SQL injection is just the availability of your server or uh, your application, right? right. It's another thing people don't think of is if you're able to write any kind of SQL code you want and inject it, you could potentially write code that will tie up your server or potentially write disrupt access for other users if you just lock, you know, everything in the database and no one else can access your app, right? That's downtime for your application and that causes another big problem too. Yeah, that's interesting because when people start chasing a performance issue, 
or blocking it. There that, that listen to think, oh, could it be a SQL injection attack that somebody's messing with you? Right. Right. Along with that, right? So who ultimately then is the owner of this? Now, for from our listeners, most of them are compañeros or, you know, data folks in general. We do have some developers out there that, that listen. But I can see this very quickly pointing into, a, well, that's not my problem. <laughs> that type of issue, right? It's almost like, well, it's a security issue. No, it's a, you know, whoever's writing the stored prox, you know, issue. It's a, and so I guess, um, you know, may, maybe we should start digging into how, how can, it, so as from a DBA perspective, how can I know or what should I be looking for to see if, if SQL injection is even a problem for me? Sure. Is, is there a good test there? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess to answer your first question, right, with, with finger pointing, I feel like when it comes to security, I feel like when it comes to security, it's, it never solely depends on a, on a, on one person, right? Sure. In, it in takes terms, a village. It takes a village with security. You know, the more layers you have, the better off you are typically. And so whether it's, you know, you're a DBA and you have injectable code in a stored procedure that's on one of your boxes, right? Obviously, you're probably responsible for that, even though it could be a developer who wrote that code, but it should also be their responsibility to not write this type of code. Sure. And then there you could have, you know, people, if you're in a large company who has, you know, security, uh, you know, whole groups devoted to security, it should be on their radars too if they're running you know, different pieces of software that look, uh, that profile maybe the types of, you know, data that's going to your servers, you know, it's on them too. So it's really, I don't think any one person is responsible. I think we're all responsible. Um, and in terms of if you, maybe if you're a DBA and you're, you don't know what's on that server, you want to see if you're vulnerable, right? Because last thing you want is getting an email saying, hey, why did, why did you cause all our data to get lost? Um, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a few different things you could do none of them are 100% foolproof. You know, I've written some scripts on my blog that basically look at the various system views that, you know, search for queries inside your procedures and functions that may have dynamic string execution occurring, right? So you can you can pretty easily search the definitions of procs and views and everything else to see, you know, are dynamic strings being executed and then that'll help you narrow down where you can start looking to see if you have inject injectable code. Okay, so I'm looking for execute SQL in my store procedures, and then that's I can start testing there. Is that basically yeah. the yeah? Yeah, and that you know, and that's the the reason that's not foolproof. Your procedure is even though you can say you know find me where my definition text is like execute or like sp execute SQL. You know, one, if you find things, it's not necessarily mean that they're injectable. But two, sure. it doesn't account for all the ad hoc queries that might be coming to your server, right? I mean, that's oh, only right, searching right. your procedures. But if a developer has hard coded a, you know, a SQL query into their app, you, right. you're you not going to catch that in the system definitions there. Yep. Uh, I think it's not trivial because I think about all the ORMs, right? Right, and that's there. I mean, that's ninety. I mean, percent of what they're doing, right, is you know creating that code for the developer and then slinging it to the database. So yeah, yep. So yeah, just jumping back there to the whole SP execute SQL place, for instance. I mean, one of the things that that, that I ran into a problem with a couple of years ago, I was dealing with parameter sniffing issues, mm -hmm. and I'd been to Pass Summit, and I uh, I think that was in Charlotte that year, and I had SQL injection out doing dynamic SQL as a way to work around some of the stored procedure parameter sniffing issues you had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Came back and learned from that and adapted some stored procedures to it to, to work that way, do, using dynamic SQL safely with parameters, of course. But then immediately, everyone jumped on it saying you can't use SP execute SQL ever because you're going to allow parameter sniffing. <laughs> or, sorry, I said that wrong. You're, you're going to allow SQL injection. And yeah. I think that that's one of the sort of misconceptions is that simply using dynamic SQL that's being executed doesn't necessarily equate to, yes, you're allowing SQL injection in. Would you, I mean, would you agree with that or do you have any thoughts on that? Right. So, I mean, dynamic SQL exists for a reason. I know, I mean, like you're alluding to, there's a lot of negative 
I guess, association with it because of the injection problems. But there are really good things that being a dynamic, really good things that you can do with dynamic SQL. Like you're saying, right, parameter sniffing, that is one way to potentially solve a parameter sniffing problem. You know, there's other things where you can, you know, if you want, if you have an application and you need like the ultimate performance to be, you know, extracted from it, sometimes the only way you can get that performance is by writing a dynam dynamic SQL query. Or maybe you need to vary the output of your of your result set, right? And dynamic SQL is the only way to do it. Or, yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot of very valid scenarios to use dynamic SQL. It's just that SQL injection could be a side effect that you need to be careful of. Right, right. And I think that that's, that's the key there is making sure that where you are using dynamic SQL, it is safe from the SQL injection perspective. Right. So, so are there red flags there that you're looking for? You know, once you, you know, once you've uh, identified the uh, store, you try. What's the what, what's the next step? Yeah. So it's it's interesting. It's an interesting problem. I personally think the the best way to understand, you know, how to protect against it is to, you know, fire up your own test database. And I mean, don't do this at work or anything where you might get flagged <laughs> by security. Do this at home or you know unless you are, you know, a secure in info security and that's your job to test this kind of stuff out. But you know, try it out and that's that's the best way you're going to be able to learn really how it works and how to protect against it. But things you can look for, right, is if you are concatenating parameters into your strings, right? That's probably the biggest thing to watch out for because if if that's happening, basically you are allowing input data coming from a user malicious or otherwise, and they're able to, you know, append to the SQL string that you're building dynamically. Okay. Now, okay, so knuckle dragging Neanderthal that I am, right? Yep. Yep. I feel like I have to ask this question just from our just from our previous conversation. The whole reason I'm using dynamic SQL and a very simple example is, you know, uh, I'm just going to go, you know, so select star from, you know, table where parameter equals my store procedure parameter, right? I'm going to allow right. people to, to pass that in. So if I, if I, if that's just one, if it's equals, it's okay. But if I'm adding like parameter one plus parameter two, is that where I get into trouble or? Yeah. So if, if you think of that exact example you gave, right, where you're building this string select from table where parameter equals, and then that's all a string, and then you're concatenating in a parameter, mm -hmm. right? That is potentially vulnerable to SQL injection. And I would argue to a simple S SQL string like that to begin with. Like gotcha. that, is, that is a query where, you, where you're parameterizing the value of a, of a where predicate, for example. That's mm -hmm. something that you can parameterize and use, you know, for example, SP execute SQL to safely execute. You shouldn't be using necessarily dynamic SQL to execute that kind of statement to begin with. Gotcha. And that's a problem that I've seen with just, you know, people are coming from maybe developer backgrounds, not to single them out. Full disclosure, I'm a developer, right? Uh, <laughs> oh, man. We're going to vet our, we're gonna have to vet our guests a little bit better, Steve. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, if, depending on your background, building a dynamic string where you're concatenating, you know, user input values to a query might be acceptable in whatever language you're coming from. Um, right, especially right. if, you know, if you that they want a language you're coming from. Um, right, especially right. if, you know, if your knowledge on that subject is maybe a little older. So it's, it's not necessarily that people are doing this you know, knowingly or that they want to write injectable code. It could just be that their background is that's the correct way to do it or that's an okay way to do it. That's how I've always done it. But it's not necessarily safe, secure SQL code. Yep. And, and I think like from the perspective of, uh, application code that's making a call into SQL Server. Usually when somebody gets started and learns a new programming language or a new interface to talk to the database, uh, usually the examples are all out there without parameterization. They just show you concatenating something. Oh, yeah. So when somebody yeah. jumps in and they're just learning it and they haven't learned the value behind parameters and how to use them, uh, it's just sometimes you just don't know any better. You know, that's 
that's so true, Steve. I mean, so SQL injection, right? Just as a as a quick background, has been around for there's how to write a quote around forever, right? This is not something that's new. This is not right. something that's even in the past decade, right? This has been around since the '90s. It's been around, you know, with SQL Server, probably, you know, from SQL six and seven. It's been a problem for that long, and it continues to be a problem for that long. And I think you're exactly right. I think a lot of you know those beginner tutorials that maybe you follow, they're just trying to teach concepts of here's how to here's how to do something, here's how to write a query, and they're kind of foregoing the whole security aspect of it, and that's that's unfortunate. But. Yep. And whenever I see one of those, I always try and go to that next step to understand how to use parameters, not just from the SQL injection perspective, but also from the performance and reusability perspective. Sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. So are there any kind of misconceptions out there that you see around SQL injection that people are commonly confused for or, or get wrong? Yeah. So, you know, I've definitely interacted with people where maybe they are aware of SQL injection and kind of what it is, but they think, okay, you know, this doesn't apply to me for a bunch of reasons. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things I hear is that oh, you know, it's okay. I don't need to really protect against SQL injection because the structure of my database is in public. So an attacker isn't going to be able to, you know, know what to query. And, you know, that's a huge misconception uh, for multiple reasons. You know, one is that a lot of our databases, right, that we probably use, they have really easy to guess table names and column names, right? <laughs> yep, you know, sure. Lots of databases probably have a products table or a user's yeah. table. So it's it, it doesn't even matter, right, if, you're, if your database is kind of public knowledge or not. Someone's going to be able to guess it. But then, you know, taking that a step further, there's great, you know, ways in SQL to find out the structure. It's, it, it doesn't even matter, right, if, you're, if your database is kind of public knowledge or not. Someone's going to be able to guess it. But then, you know, taking that a step further, there's great, you know, ways in SQL to find out the structure of your databases, you know, like sys.objects and things like that, that'll actually just tell you, you know, all the tables and columns in your database. And, you know, malicious users know about that. And so even if they don't know the structure of your database, they can very easily find that, find it out. Another common misconception I hear then, you know, if I follow up on that is, okay, well, you know, I obfuscate my table names or something like that, which, you know, I hope you don't do that. But once again, uh, using something like sys.object, sys.columns is going to reveal that information. So it doesn't matter if, you know, your, your columns are called A1, A2, A3. Um, it's, it's to a, a hacker or someone trying to get to your data. It's not going to stop them at all. Uh, well, now, on that, well, well, now, so having said that, if um, an application user that just has read and write to that database, mm -hmm. Don't those don't don't those objects then are no longer available? Yes. Is that not a yes? Okay. So that's a that's a great point, Carlos. Right. That's that's one of the when I'm trying to write secure code and trying to protect an application from SQL injection. You know, that's one of the number one things that you want to do for all your code, right? That you're writing. That's accepting, um, you know, user input parameters is lock down that user that's executing the code to kind of minimize damage. It still might not right. fully uh, protect you from SQL injection, but it's going to limit what that malicious user is able to find out or do in your database. Right. So they're going to have to work a little bit harder, right? Which may or may not be their, you know, prerog you know prerogative. Right. And if yeah. you, I mean, if you take that that user and right, you only give it read access, and you've got to, go you know, table or that schema or that database, depending how you know how well you protect that that log in there. So w one of the misconceptions that I came across, I'm just curious what your thoughts on it might be, but was uh, around a web, like, let's say it's a web system and there's thousands of web pages that are accessing the database. And you've got to go through, obviously, and make sure that every one of those is SQL injection safe. But one of the misconceptions that I experienced in a management situation was that we found there was SQL injection problems in a system. We presented it to the management team and their response was, well, let's just, because there's two types of pages on the site. There's the pages that, that you can see before you actually log into the system. And there's the pages you can see after you log into the system. So we know who you are. 
And the response was, well, let's just make sure all the pages that not that you don't have to be logged in to see. And this is a public site used by and everywhere in to see. And this is a public site used by thousands <laughs> of people across the world. But let's just make sure the pages that you that are public that don't require a login are SQL uh, injection safe. And we're not going to worry about the other ones because those are logged in users and they would never do anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, there's a, a bunch of red flags there, right? But yeah, I mean, you need to protect against injection everywhere. I mean, depends on your application, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure many people have created, you know, multiple Twitter accounts or multiple Facebook profiles. You know, what's to stop someone from creating a fake account into that system, right? And even though yep. they're logged in, um, it doesn't mean anything, right? They, that malicious user, I mean, people who want to get into systems are really good at kind of covering their tracks. So <laughs> it doesn't matter if they're, you know, authenticated into your, your app there, you know, unless you're tying your users to like their, their pass, it's a big red flag, like their, their passports or something like that. You got some very, you know, high secure verified application where you're not letting just anybody register. But even then, I mean, you still want to protect against injection. Right, right. And this sure. was one where anyone could just sign up for a demo account or a trial account in the system and they were in. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's yeah. a big red flag, especially, right, because nowadays it's, it used to be that, you know, another misconception I've heard, you know, a lot is, oh, you know, my, my website, my application is just so, so small. No one would ever, you know, try to attack me, right? Like I'm, I'm selling, you know, boutique garden gnomes online and I have, you know, 50 customers a year and they're all really into garden gnomes. And so no, I know none of them are malicious, right? But the, the fact of the matter is it's not that like someone needs to be actively, you know, searching for injection vulnerabilities on your site, you know, by hand, like going into the login form and, and trying different things, right? There's plenty of tools that hackers have. It's an open source and the internet, uh, and have these tools <laughs> automatically test for injection vulnerabilities just to find which sites out there have them so they can, you know, potentially get the data and, you know, do various things with it. Yeah, scary stuff. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's also cool. So, like, one of the tools I, I want to mention is, is called SQL Math. It's, a, it's an open source tool, right, used for automating SQL injection testing. So um, ah. if you're able to, if you have an application and you really want to test it out, right, you don't have to use these kinds of apps, right? These apps work kind of both ways. They help out the attackers, but they can also help you out on the defensive side to actually test your own applications to see, you know, very quickly and easily, you know, is my application vulnerable to SQL injection attacks? So works both ways. Right. Very cool. Well, I guess, I mean, if you've got someone who's listening and maybe this will um, exposure to SQL injection, the topic of SQL injection, is, is there anything you might recommend or any tips you may have to, that may help with preventing it? Like wh where you would start first if this is brand new to you? Sure. So, so usually this is kind of how I evaluate and try to protect against SQL injection. Uh, you know, first thing is, do I need to be using dynamic SQL? Um, because like we kind of talked about earlier, a lot of times it could just be someone wrote a query that's dynamic and is concatenating in parameters because that's the only way they know how to do it. But if you're just concatenating a, a where predicate value and you, know, you don't even need to be doing that, then just get rid of your dynamic SQL. You could just pass in a parameter to your query and it'll evaluate perfectly fine without needing to build a dynamic query string. So honestly, that is by far the best thing you can do to protect your, again, yourself against, against dynamic SQL um, injection attacks is just get rid of dynamic SQL. Always the first thing to check is, you know, do you actually need to be using dynamic SQL? Yeah, why was this put in place, right? What right, was the yeah, just, just a common kind of common sense, you know, sanity check to, you know, can I write this a different way and still get the same result without making myself vulnerable? Because, you know, once again, injection attacks only can happen with dynamic string execution. If you don't have that dynamic string execution, you're good to go. Sure. And this, I guess I would do want to make one point. We were kind of talking about, you know, the, the you know, everybody needs to pay attention. One additional thought that I had, and, and Troy Hunt was talking about this, and this is more with the SSL certificates, you know, on, on small sites. But the idea was that 
Yes, they may not, like if you're the, you know, going back to the garden gnomes, mm-hmm. they may not be trying to attack your site, but they may be trying to get into your site to then send malicious. Mm-hmm. They may not be trying to attack your site, but they may be trying to get into your site to then send malicious stuff to somebody else. Oh, yeah. And that's even a bigger problem because now you get blacklisted, you know, and so your 50 customers go to zero. Yeah. You know, Google's going to blacklist you and all that other stuff. Right. That's I mean, that's a huge that's a that's a great point. And that was a great blog post from Troy Hunt there about that. And just, you know, with SQL injection in general, if I mean, if you ever want to know numbers, it's hard to get numbers. But uh, Troy Hunt runs this website. Have I been pwned? P-W-N-E-D, which if you're not signed up for, you should. It basically is a notification service for if your e- your email address or usernames are in a data breach that gets exposed. But if you go to their data breach page there, you can just do like a control F find on the web page and search for SQL injection. And you'll see all of these companies, I mean, these huge companies, I'm talking like, you know, Yahoo and, and Sony who have, you know, specifically who have had data leaked because of SQL injection attacks, right? So this is like a, a really serious deal, right? That, it, that affects everybody. And sure. Sometimes it's nice. I mean, not nice. It, I mean, it stinks for those companies, right? <laughs> and for the sure, users exactly. that that data gets right. released, but it's, it's not just, you know, you by yourself. I mean, this is a major problem that affects everybody. No, I agree. And then of course, you know, if you get, if you are subject to it, you know, it, that's not fun. And it's not fun for the the managers uh, because you know then because you know the, you haven't planned for it you don't know the extent of it you may not even know where it is so then all of a sudden they're kind of throwing money at a problem to try and stop it and they don't always know where it's going exactly it's, yep. it's like it's, it can get very expensive very yeah quickly. I mean so you want to do your best to avoid that right and so option one is just get rid of that dynamic SQL if you don't have the use of dynamic SQL in your in your database. Um, you know, the thing you would want to try to do is use something like SP Execute SQL, which will parameterize your dynamically built queries. And so that that is a safe way to allow, you know, input parameters to be passed in and executed in as part of a dynamic SQL query string without, you know, falling vulnerable to that injection attack. Gotcha. Now, you know, SP execute SQL has its downsides though, right? It, it, although you can pass in a dynamically generated SQL query into it to execute, you still can't parameterize everything with it. So things like table names, right? You wouldn't be able to pass in as a parameter, even using SP execute SQL. It just, it won't work. And yep. so a lot right. of times a table name maybe might be something that you do want to parameterize. Oh, and that's an interesting one. Have do you have a good option name? Do you have a good option for how to do that? Yeah. So, um, you know, usually the, the best option would be to use the the quote name function in SQL Server, and what that basically just escapes um, characters um, by default. If you don't pass in any parameters besides just the string that you're escaping, it adds brackets around it to kind of make it a system object name, and and that'll that'll protect you for sure the the downside to using quote name right so quote name is like the best solution if you can't use sps execute sql the downside is that it's limited to you know outputting only 128 characters so if your input for some reason uh is longer than 128 characters you need to start getting a little creative with what you do and that opens you up to potential problems right <laughs> and then you start concatenating you know all these other things together and yeah you kind of back to square one yeah so <laughs> so there was one example i saw where they, they were passing a name that needed to be concatenated in to a string and there were only five or six options five or six possible table names they could pass pass in so the solution they came up with was instead of just concatenating them it put it inside of an if statement that said if it's table name one or table name two or table name three it injects not a parameter, but the actual text of, of what that table name was. And if it doesn't match one of those known table names, it falls through and aborts out of the sort of procedure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, I mean, if you are able to do that, that is great, right? And that's net, not just right on the DBA side, but if you're working with your developers, you know, the first line of attack, right? First line of defense for these types of attacks is the developers, is the, is the app code 
right? They should be doing all these things too. They should be sanitizing their inputs. They should be checking that the input data is is a valid, you know, entry. Like if there's only six table names, there should be, you know, it should be one of those six names. And then if you're a, you know, entry, like if there's only six table names, there should be, you know, it should be one of those six names. And then if you're able to do that similar kind of check with an if statement in, in T SQL, then all the better. It's just, you know, problem, the problems start to crop up when you have a more complex input quantity of, of values that you're inputting. You know, if, if it's six tables or 10 tables, it's pretty easy to handle. But once you get, you know, to the realm of, you know, many more than that, and you start wanting to write maybe what at the time seemed like smarter you know, validation functions or, or sanitizing functions, that's where you get yourself into trouble because it's really hard to write, you know, a function that's 100% secure that kind of validates data like that. Sure. Right. Very um, good points. And so what I've seen a lot, right, is people will, will use like the replace function, for example. One common technique to prevent, usually that injected code is going to use a quote in it somewhere to, you know, to end one statement and, you know, help start another statement. So what people will do is they'll try to write a replace function that replaces single quotes with, you know, a set of two single quotes to kind of escape that quote and prevent, you know, the, the attacker from succeeding in what they wanted to do. And while that works great for some scenarios, um, it doesn't work in all scenarios. And that's, that's, the, that's the big caution with trying to kind of write your own sanitation functions in SQL Server using something with replace because it's, it's not always going to work. And it's not always right to think of every scenario that an attacker right. might try is impossible, especially since even if you're somehow able to do it today, that doesn't mean that some, you know, new feature in SQL in the future is going <laughs> to, you know, that you're going to stay on top of that, that you're going to stay on top of that forever, or whoever ends up maintaining your code. Right. And so that's just a really big problem there. Mm. And like we mentioned, right, locking down the user uh, account that's executing your SQL queries, right, makes a big difference. That's something I would implement in all scenarios for sure. Oh, yeah. And I, I don't know how many times I've seen the web system at different places that runs as the SA user. <laughs> oh, gosh. And that's it, one of the first things I always want to get changed because it's just so dangerous. It's Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that opens you up to, to everything. <laughs> yep. Should we go ahead and do uh, SQL Family then? Let's do it. So, Bert, how did you first get started with SQL Server? Uh, well, I started my kind of database petitions. So, Bert, how did you first get started with SQL Server? Uh, well, I started my kind of database petitions in my SQL probably when I was 11 or 12 years old. Oh, well, running starting young. Yeah, just running running a website, PHP website, you know, coding oh, my okay. own blog, having, you know, tons of SQL injection vulnerabilities there. And that's actually how I learned. <laughs> that's how I learned about SQL injection was actually with my SQL. I would I would look at the logs and, you know, say, okay, what's what's all this weird, you know, one equals one input that people are, you know, submitting. Right. So that, that was my start with databases. I obviously didn't know much back then. Uh, I still don't think I know much now. Um, but that kind of opened the doors to, you know, get hired into a Microsoft shop where they have SQL Server. And yeah, sure. What would it be? Well, you know, if you had asked me this question a year ago, I think I would have very different answers. But I've okay. been really impressed with how kind of the speed of development has become with SQL Server in the past year. Um, like that would have right. been my my big, you know, wish list item would have been just, you know, get more features out faster. Uh, but it seems like they're doing that. So I'm really satisfied with that. I guess the one thing I'd still like to change is is for them to take like a release, maybe not a major release, but to just take the time to really polish the existing things that are in there. So like, I'm talking about things like maybe you know, making error messages more user friendly instead of just telling me some data got truncated, 
you know, point me to, to, the, to that data so I know, so I don't have to go figure it out on my own. Or if I run out of space, sure. you know. Can, Which line, dang it. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, if, for me, it's if I'm using a tool every day, every day, right? Those little kinds of things make a big difference into how, you know, happy I am and how, how happy I am to use a tool. So that would be huge for me because all, I mean, all the features are great. I'm happy with them. Um, it's just, you know, polishing all the rough edges would be, would be great. Okay. I like that. What's the best piece of career advice you've received? My favorite career advice that someone told me once was, to, I mean, I guess the popular one is, you know, fake it till you make it. But someone <laughs> kind of has their own modified version of that. There's this photographer, Chase Jarvis, and he always talks about, you know, make it till you make it, which basically just, mm. just, you know, keep, keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, eventually you, you'll get to where you want to be just by kind of continuously improving and getting better at whatever your craft is, right? In his case, it was photography. But for me, it's like, I want to become better at SQL Server. You know, the only way to do that is just to keep, you know, doing things with SQL Server, getting better at whatever your craft is, right? In his case, it was photography. But for me, it's like, I want to become better at SQL Server. You know, the only way to do that is just to keep, you know, doing things with SQL Server, you know, pushing myself to learn new things and, you know, right. blogging and making, like that. making mistakes, right? And yeah. then, you know, learning from those mistakes. Exactly. That's, that's the big thing, right? The fear of failure can hold us back sometimes. Right. I mean, hopefully you don't do any injection mistakes in production, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to learn. Yep. Okay. So our final question, uh, if you could have one superhero power, what would it be and why would you want it? <laughs> so thinking about this, I think I'd want to be able to like control time, not like be able to go back to, you know, 10 years or 20 years or something like that. But if there was like an undo button for where I could just kind of go back in time, some limited, you know, duration, maybe like three minutes or five minutes, um, not only would that prevent that no one expects. So uh, I think that'd be pretty cool. Then you don't have to deal with all the uh, ramifications of, you know, changing history and the whole, you know, future outcome is different. So I think, you know, three minutes back wouldn't, wouldn't be too bad. Okay. So the time control undo stack. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Bert, thanks so much for being on the program today. We do appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you guys. It's a pleasure. Great to have you, Bert. Learned some things along the way too. So special thanks again to Bert for being on the show. We do appreciate it and uh, coming in and helping us know a little bit more about SQL injection. Yes, indeed. I think that chatting with Bert definitely brought up a few things there that have got me thinking. And I know I've, of course, I've dealt with SQL injection in the past, but just sort of things to keep up on and things to go check. And I guess one of the takeaways we have from there is, well, what are you going to do first? Right. If now you've heard this, you know about SQL injection, or d about SQL injection, and you want to go find out, do you have a problem? Yeah, because it's not exactly straightforward, right? There are several components to consider, but I think the one that uh, that we thought was taking a peek at your stored procedures and seeing what uses dynamic SQL. Yep. And then going from there. And then specifically going from there, what I would do is if you have a test or de development environment that you can risk messing up, that you can restore easily. <laughs> Go take a look at some of those procedures that have SQL or, or that have uh, dynamic SQL in them and try them out. Pretend you're trying to hack it and see what you can do to break it through changing some of the parameters around. Right. Add a semicolon quote or a quote semicolon select star from something and see if you can actually pull data out that way. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, you know, try not to get too scared when <laughs> you actually get data back that first time <laughs> bring it up and say it's time <laughs> yes yes that, that that would be the that would be the scary the scary part and then i and i guess i think i guess it's fair maybe let's work through that scenario right then obviously you know you got to go through your change control process or bring it up and say hey look this is what i found you know team i, I think like burke did mention but it takes a village and so you don't feel like you have to do this alone but at the same time don't ignore it either right right and also keep in mind, let's say you do find a problem in a stored procedure. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem that's exposed to the world. I mean, the web application or other application that's sitting between the end user and the database may have checks and constraints built in to prevent that injection from happening. So that's right. Uh, but once you've found it, 
then you can go and try and figure out, is it indeed a problem? Uh, and then go from there. That's right. Well, awesome. Last thoughts? Oh, I guess, I mean, with SQL injection, it's just one of those things that if you don't know about, uh, that's one thing. But if if you know that you have it, at least you can go out and figure out a plan to fix it. It's not necessarily the end of the world at that point. It's better to know and to have a plan to fix it than to not know that it's, and have the possibility of being there. Right. And we, we kind of mentioned it. So Bert mentioned that it's been around for a while. This is not a, well, Microsoft needs to fix this issue, right? This is the, the way that we develop issue. I mean, unless they're going to, you know, somehow prevent you from concatenating strings, which I think would make everybody crazy. Right. right? Like, <laughs> and, and so I think this is one of those things where, you know, we, we have the responsibility to take a peek at it. It's still around, right? It's, it is still an issue. And so, again, you know. Yep. And then, what, luck to you. <laughs> yeah. And once you figure out the extent of it, then you need to figure out how to work with your management team so that they understand what's involved. Exactly. And that this is not something that was just introduced to your database, perhaps, that it, you found it and it, what's involved. Exactly. And that this is not something that was just introduced to your database, perhaps, that it, you found it and it needs to be addressed. And then there's probably going to be some expense in fixing that. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. And of course, if there's other ways to go about identifying that or resolving it, or that we, of course, would be very interested to know. And you can reach out to us, send us an email, social media, what have you, comments on the show notes page. We'd be very interested in, in getting your, your thoughts as well. Yep. I can remember just on that point, I can remember one time after I'd set up a WordPress blog, I don't know, several, many years back. And I remember looking at the, the web logs on it to see what, what people were hitting on the page. And I realized, wow, there's a whole bunch of these. I mean, you know, I actually saw SQL injection attempts coming through in. Oh, is that right? In, in the, uh, the server log on what was being passed through through the query strings. And, uh, that's one of those things that you want to make sure that. Yeah, if you're using applications that are exposed to that, they're up to date. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, that's one of the downsides. Well, I don't know if it's downside is the right word. It can be a slippery slope, right? And sometimes people are like, well, if I don't think about it, maybe it will just go away. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, but security is, uh, yeah, kind of Pandora's box almost in a sense. And yeah, once you, once you get started, it can be... Yeah, you're like, do I really want to see all of this? <laughs> right, right. And if you find it, are you then treated as the hero or the bad guy? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Culture, company culture play play a big role in that, right? Yeah. What do you mean we have to change all of our code? Well, it's not safe. <laughs> uh, maybe if you just stayed quiet, it, it, it would have been a more peaceful day in the office, but it wouldn't have been a bit more safe or a safer day. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, then I wonder if, um, you know, I know the larger organizations, I don't know if, if smaller organizations, I've never heard of it, but you SQL Server in the news, Facebooks and the Microsofts of the world actually paying hackers to report bugs rather than spread them around. And, uh, you know, so I, if there's something like that, that might be another option if you wanted to do the quiet route, you know, anonymous email. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yep. Okay, well, I think that's going to do it for today's episode. Our music for SQL Server in the News is by Mansardian, used under Creative Commons. And don't forget to sign up for the Database Health Monitor webcast if you're interested in finding out about the Quick Scan Report. We'll be doing that in a couple of weeks. That's right, at sqldatapartners.com slash webcast. And as always, we're very interested in getting your thoughts and feedback on the episodes. You can do that through social media, on the podcast page, through some of the episodes. One of the ways you can connect with us is on LinkedIn. I'm at Carlos L. Chacon. Or you can find me on LinkedIn at Steve Stedman. And we'll see you on the SQL Trail.